Welcome everyone, and thank you for taking the time today to join Allegra Marketing Print Mail to learn about five simple steps that you can take to make a big impact in your branding. My name is Tiffany Moss, and I'm really excited to be your moderator today. So after this next hour, you're going to walk away knowing how to take immediate action on small but critical aspects of your business that make a big difference for the entire lifespan of your customer relationships. If you find you need a partner to rely on to get some of this done for your business, we'll also share some ways that Allegra can help. So just a couple things before we get started. Please interact with us by using the chat box or the hashtag. We'd love to hear your questions and comments throughout, and you will be sent a recording following the webinar. But before we jump right into the content, I wanna take a moment to let you know that we are thinking of everyone and we hope that all are very safe and healthy right now. We recognize that we have people from all across North America dialed into today's webinar. And while each market is unique and somewhat different, everyone has been impacted by the pandemic in some way, whether big or small. And in times like these, we do need to come together. So at Allegra, we are choosing to respond to this by sticking to the core of who we are as a brand. And that's delivering solutions to our local customers and businesses in our community. It's why we're hosting this webinar today, really, because we believe in the importance of sharing ideas and resources to help you be a little smarter and a little more resourceful, especially in today's uncertain times. As we're all having to really rethink about how we approach our business operations, we do recognize that we're not alone. The value of relying on each other and perseverance has really never been greater. And our goal is to be that trusted partner in good times and bad. And we really hope that that content that we're sharing today is gonna do just that for you. So when we think about who can provide information to make us a little bit smarter and also provide actionable takeaways that are simple to implement starting today, Carla Johnson is definitely the person for the job. Over the last two decades, Carla has helped architects and actuaries, executives and volunteers, and innovators and visionaries leverage the art of storytelling to inspire action through her amazing experiences. Her work with Fortune 500 brands has really set the stage for many of her eight books. Consistently named one of the top influencers in B2B, digital, and content marketing, she regularly challenges conventional thinking. And today, she's here to help us think about some simple actions that we can take that will have a big impact on, impact on our branding. So with that being said, I'd like to welcome Carla Johnson. Thank you, Tiffany, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's been really fun connecting with some of you on social media the last couple of weeks, and I appreciate you sharing the questions that you have because it's really, it's important to me, and I know it's important to Tiffany and the rest of the Allegra team that we are here and we can help you with the things that really matter the most right now. And it's interesting in how timely our topic, how timely our topic is today, you know, especially with everything that's going on around us, because we all need to be very strategic in how we show up as a brand and how we continue to move through, through so many different aspects of what's going on with the coronavirus and how it's affecting our businesses. And it was interesting. Yesterday, I was talking to the head of a venture capital firm. And I asked him, what's one of the one of the things that matters most to a company that they just don't realize? And he said, it's the brand. And especially right now, because he said the companies that struggle the most are going to be the ones that haven't invested in their brand and the ones that are going to be able to see um, a faster recovery and a stronger recovery out of our current pandemic situation are those that understand that their brand is actually a very strategic asset. And it's what keeps them from being perceived as a commodity in their industry. And we've talked on some of the past Allegra webinars about the details of shifting your brand from being perceived as a co commodity into a strategic necessity. And after we're done today, I encourage you to go back and, and look at some of those, listen to some of those webinars because it's important that you think about how your brand shows up in putting safety and community first while also doing business. And it's how you do that is 
a way that you can make an impact and continue to build those relationships because it starts with that brand purpose that we've talked about on some other webinars. You know, like for, for Allegra, it's delivering solutions to help their customers and their businesses in the communities that they serve. For me, it's teaching people how to rethink the work that they do and the impact that they can have. Now, for you, it's specific to your brand and that will influence how you implement the things that we're going to talk about today. So you can do both. You can you can be strategic about it. You can be sensitive to the situation. And that's part of what we'll cover today to help you do exactly that. So when we look at what's going on, you know, in the in the world today, everybody is fighting for attention. It's it's not news and it's gotten more um, distinct in the last few months. You know, every big company, every small company, every startup, every influencer. And they think that the fact that we're now really shifting into the digital world and digital channels means that that's everything that we should focus on is this digital world. But there's so much more to creating an impact than just moving everything to a digital environment. Because if you look at what's going on, you know, take social media, for example, people um, jumped on the social media bandwagon because it was a way to be digitally social and you can see here this growth of social media you know this year 79 percent of americans have a social media profile some you know i hear a lot of my friends saying i stay off social media right now because there's just so much i'm just inundated by so much stuff that's going on and this is up from just 10 percent in 2008 and 50 percent in 2011. so if you're looking at reaching people and making an impact through social media you're, you're facing not only tough, tough competition right now for attention, you're facing a lot of people being really particular about what kind of information from what brands they'll pay attention to. Um, there's also all of the algorithms of the platform themselves that keep you know changing and you have to keep up with and they give priority to certain kinds of content and what gets censored. So it's, it's not to say that social media isn't important, but you really have to look at is it the right strategy for how you make an impact right now? And then, you know, some people say, you know, let's look at email and you compare social media with email use. And you can see in 2017, the number of email users around the world was 3.7 billion people. And experts say that this is expected to grow to 4.3 billion users by 2022, you know, and that's half of the world's population. So it's clear that just choosing a platform isn't the answer. And there's more to making an impact than just looking at the numbers of people who use a particular channel. So that's really what we have to keep in mind. Now, as we look at what, what actually captures people's attention, we look at, okay, I can't tell you, and I'm a little embarrassed to admit this, how much time I have watched videos of cats being scared with cucumbers because it's hilarious. You know, then there's all the lovey puppy pictures and videos, there's babies, and then maybe the, the biggest one of all is babies dressed up like puppies. This really is the competition for attention for your brand. So it's important that you think about it because it's more than just your world and your industry. It's in general, where do people put their attention? Now, these tactics about the cats with the cucumbers and the puppies and the babies, they work really, really well because it's very human. It pulls on our emotions. Um, it, it makes us feel things that we normally, normally don't feel when we interact with a brand. And it's this, this sense of our humanness that matters so much in how your brand shows up right now. Now, this is the foundation for how you make an impact as a, as a brand is that you can't just focus on what it is that you sell. You know, all of your traditional branding platform taglines and things that feel rather robotic. You really have to look at how do you bring the emotion out in your brand. And I tell you, I, I get all sorts of crazy emails and I got one the other day from a company I'd never even heard of and they started out by saying, we hope that you and your family are staying safe during this um, scary time with the pandemic. And then they went right into trying to sell me elevators. And you know, that's, it's just such a crazy connection that it's, um, they think that just putting in one sentence of emotion is how you make a, um, 
an emotional impact with the brand, but it's done so bad. And we see a lot of examples of this, of, of brands who are trying to force an emotion into what they do that's not authentic. But there are things that you can do. And, and I say simple steps because they truly are simple steps. And I look, I've had so many companies come to me and say, okay, we just went through this huge branding exercise and we have all the documents from our agencies and you know some have spent tens of thousands of dollars some hundreds of thousands even you know up to a million and they say but we don't know what to do with it now and this this is where the rubber hits the road is that you have to know how to take what you want to convey about your brand and now let's actually do something with it so i don't want if you if you haven't focused on branding a lot or you're really looking to rejuvenate and make sure you're considered a strategic asset right now as a brand or as a partner, I wanna give you five simple steps of things you can do right now or double check how well you're doing them that will make a big impact in how your brand shows up. So, okay, we're gonna kick this off. Number one, story first and format second. And this, this is so critical. And the reason is because if we look at how we talk about our brands now when we say okay let's we need to create something um we need to be able to reach our customers we need to be able to you know make sure we're connected that they know that we're here for them the first thing that people do is that you say okay let's do a newsletter let's do a webinar let's do a web you know landing page case study whatever it is fill in the blank and then they say okay now, what can we say? What story can we tell that fits into that particular box? Now, it's it's interesting because as Tiffany and I and some of the other team were talking about looking at things to do for 2020, the first thing that we talked about, okay, what's what's the story that we tell? Now, how do we start to break that up into different types of format? Now, the difference that happens when you do this is that you are able to start with that emotional connection of a story first and understand what happens next. Like how do you connect with the people emotionally and now how do you start to use that content in different formats that's very strategic? For example, when you use a, when you think about what makes a great story, like what, what makes you stay up way past bedtime to finish a book? What makes you not turn off a Netflix or you know, Hulu or whatever else you're watching? What makes you go back and reread or rewatch a story over and over and over again is that you have the classic aspects, the classic details that make up a story. You have a theme, you have a plot, you have characters, um, you have chapters in it, there's conflict, there's tension, there's resolution. It's these aspects, these characteristics of what you use to architect a great story that create the intrigue and the engagement. Now in Hollywood, um, they know that they have to look at, okay, what's the story we're gonna tell? Okay, one format is going to be a Hollywood movie, one format is going to be merchandising, one may be a book, and they look at all these different things, but they know in order to be successful and to be effective, they have to have all of the elements of a great story to start with. Now, as we look at how this plays out in the real world, this is Evan Parker, and um, he was the managing director of content strategy for NASCAR. And I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago because NASCAR had made this phenomenal transition from being a, a brand that's all about, you know, um, here's the Daytona 500 or the Indy 500 or whatever these one particular events were into being a completely different story driven brand and when i asked him what the difference was he said when he was hired the brand was really struggling and and um really was starting to become irrelevant because their major fan base which you can think of as your customer base for your brand um was getting older and the things that they had always done just weren't that you know new and unique and different and they found that people were engaging with the sport only in one particular type of event, you know, just the races. So they'd show up there or they'd watch it on TV and um, then they'd go home. You know, the event was over. And what he wanted to do is create a storyline that kept people engaged over time. You know, how do you keep people interested in car racing when you aren't able to just watch cars go around the track all year long? And what he decided to do with his team 
and say, okay, let's start telling the story of NASCAR. Let's look at these different chapters. We have the chapters of the events themselves, which they he knew that people were interested, but let's start looking at a chapter about the drivers and what the world is like for them. Let's look at a chapter about the fans and the different things that their life is like as a fan outside of the event and some of the other chapters that they had that they could talk about. And the, it was interesting in all the richness that came out. And one of the aspects was that when the drivers started to tell their stories about, you know, when they were kids and they imagined being in a, in a race car going around a track at how much, you know, over a hundred miles an hour, you know, what, how that dream led them as they grew up and how they made those choices. And now what it's like to be in the limelight. And, um, they they followed fans there was one young girl who had spina bifida and she couldn't afford um her family couldn't afford a van to um transport her in the wheelchair and one of the drivers donated the money he heard about this story and it pulled at his heartstrings and he donated the money so her family could have a van that could um help her go to her doctor's appointments or, or just get around in everyday life as a kid wants to do. And she got to meet him one time and she gave him a lucky penny and he kept it on the dashboard of his car throughout the rest of his career. So these were the things that brought the emotion and the humanness into races and what into the sport and what they found that before they were talking about just specific events and their fan base was shrinking. Um, they were starting to be considered essentially, you know, obsolete as, as a sport, as something people cared about. Um, they were always focused on format first. <clears throat> and this showed up in how their teams were organized. They had a digital team, they had a marketing team, you know, they had a entertainment team. Um, it really fractured the structure within their organizations. It was very siloed because when they looked at format, it was always dependent on these teams. And as when it came to what they talked about, it essentially was the same old thing. But after they moved to a storytelling format, what they saw is that they were able to energize this younger fan base because they saw it was more than just cars driving around the track. There was a whole different world that they got excited about. It energized interest, not only in this new younger fan base that they were trying to attract, but also in the people who had been longtime supporters. You know, they started with the story first. Evan talks about um, his team was going out to capture the story of the young girl who had grown into a, a young woman. And he said, all we cared about is let's understand her story and we'll decide what format and how many different formats and whatever later. And he said by doing that, it made every decision that they had about a format much more strategic. And those independent pieces of content were much higher quality and they saw that people loved it more. And um, it connected the teams. So when you work on a, on a bigger story, that's when everybody's able to contribute and they collaborate rather than saying, hey, this is my territory and you know, stay out of here, you're stepping on my toes. So it was able to build that collaboration between everybody. And it also brought out a lot more creativity with how they promoted drivers, um, how they looked at partners and started to build relationships and partnerships for distributing content. They started, <clears throat> excuse me, some Facebook Live things. They did some Instagram TV. It really gave them a lot of different ways to think about how they told that story because they understood who that story mattered to. Now, for Evan, the thing that he always asked himself is, um, what's the story that we want fans to see? Because they could hear and see what fans engage with. So that's what they kept focusing on is what's the story that we want fans to see. And I, you know, I think I'll, I'd like to take a break here real quick, Tiffany, if you don't mind, because I know even what we've talked about so far and generally when we talk about story versus format, people have questions. So I wanted to see if anybody had a question yet. Yeah, we've had a few come in. So I'll start with the first one. And that is, it seems easy to say to start with a story, but how do you actually do that? You know, that that's probably one of my most frequently asked questions because people are used to sitting down and talking about format. Um, there, I, I wrote a blog post last year and it goes through this tool for storytelling called Exercise of the Five Whys. And I can, um, we can post the link with the webinar or you can search for Carla Johnson 
the number five and the word wise, W-H-Y-S, because it takes you through a process that helps move you from a bigger story into the details of what you want to talk about, whether it's a product, a service, um, and it makes it very easy to tell that story first versus format. Now, one of the things that's important to know about understanding the difference between story and format is that you have to know what matters to your customers first. So when we go back to those early format questions, uh, when I was talking about how people get together and they say, let's do a newsletter, let's do a this or that. When you understand your customer really well, and you know what kind of format of content they consume, it makes these decisions really easy. And I have people say, well, how do we figure that out? Like that's, you know, does it take a lot of research, take a lot of data, you know, you have to understand how people are consuming content. It is so simple. All you have to do is call up five, 10, 15 customers and ask them. It really is that simple. And people like to tell you this because they like to get things in a format that helps them. So that's, that's a great way to start understanding how to start with the story and then, and then move to the format. Was, are there any, any other questions? Yeah, actually there is a couple more. So the other one would be, it seems like we need to find a middle ground in what we talk about right now between we're here for you during COVID-19 and how we normally would tell a story. So how do we do that? Oh, that's a good one too, because back, back to my um, example of the company that sent me the email with, oh, we care about you during this crisis. Now, do you want to buy an elevator? <laughs> it's um, what I'm seeing happen is, especially during the beginning of everything that's going on, it was really, really important for brands to be sensitive and to let people know that they're here. But customers, consumers are wanting to move on to the next step. So if you're if your communication still is purely, we're concerned about you, um, you know, we understand this is serious and, and we want to be able to help you, you need to move to the next step of that ability to say you support your customers. Now, how you do that goes back to what is it that matters to your customers? So if you look at what is their biggest struggle in serving their final customer, that's what's really helpful. So if you're B2B, you say, okay, if your customer is um, a software company, okay, what matters most to their buyer? You know, are, is it an executive person who's trying to be more efficient in what's going on? Is it a director who needs to make sure that his team is productive and doesn't have any downtime with how they use software? Now, if it's a consumer person, you know, what is, what's the problem that they're trying to solve? So if you can always work one step beyond your, your direct customer, to help them serve their audience, that's a big way to do that. And the only way you do that is by talking to your customers. And that's how you start to transition from we're here from you and into how you normally tell your story is that this is that um, middle ground that helps you stay sensitive to the situation, um, emotionally connected to what matters, yet also deliver the value that you normally would through your story. Is there, is there anything else? Yeah, so this actually ties in with that emotional connection you were just speaking about. And this one is when all brands are creating a story to establish emotional connection, how do you own a story? And this goes back, that, that's a good question too, because this goes back to a webinar that we did last year about um, creating your purpose as a brand and talking about your story from that perspective. So just as you think about the people who are most magnetic and charismatic to you, you may know two people who grew up in the Midwest, um, had to put themselves through college, got a scholarship, went to an Ivy League, you know, uh, a self-made person kind of story. But how the person tells that story is really different because the details are different. So that's what matters when you look at the story that you tell or what are the details that are truly unique and specific that only your brand can talk about. And then a little bit of how it shows up, we'll, I'll get to in um, one of our next steps about brand personality and brand voice. But really going back to what is unique and different about your brand to start with in any time that nobody else can claim. That's how you start to stand out from all that noise that we're seeing in the marketplace. Is there any others? Nope, that's it. So we can move on to step two. Okay, great. 
step two, um, back to how you stand out and be different is you need to define your brand personality and your brand voice. So a lot of times when brands establish themselves, they have, I, I call it the brand kit. You know, they have their um, logo, their tagline, um, their unique selling proposition, and a lot of tactical things. But when we look at what's missing, it's really the heart of the brand. And the brand personality is just like a person's personality. You know, it's those set of characteristics that a company exhibits in how they behave or how they talk about themselves that makes them feel like a person. And the reason this matters is because you want, you want to build that emotional connection. So back to the person's question about how do you stand out, there's, there's a really different feel to perhaps some of your friends at work and their personality and some of the people you might spend a weekend with. And this is how you start to make decisions about where you wanna spend your time and who you wanna spend time with. So it's no different than a brand. And I know there's some, some of my friends who I don't care when they call or what they want. I love their personality so much that I wanna be around them all the time. And I know I have brands that I feel like that too. And it's because of that personality that comes out to them, comes out through them. That's what makes us loyal to them because we, we kind of think of them as a, you know, a person type of um, situation, you know, person type of character that we have this connection, connection with. Now, um, there was a woman, Jennifer Aker, she did research and she came up with five personalities of a brand and what these characteristics are. So this is her framework. You look at these um, different types of personalities and I think, yeah, I, I do know people like each one of these. And you look at somebody who's really sincere and they're down to earth, they're honest, they're wholesome, they're cheerful. You know, they're, they're not your general type A, hard driving kind of personality. But you go to someone, you know, whose personality is all about excitement and, and you never know what's gonna happen. It's that spontaneity, it's spirited, you know, that they always know what's going on in the current trends and who's talking about what. And then you move to that next one about competence. You know, I, I know that there are people who I always turn to when I say I need, I need an answer I can trust. I need somebody who's been through this before, who's successful, who works hard. I also know brands that I turn to for these exact kind of things. Um, you look at sophistication and, and I think about the difference between my friends who are really sophisticated and those who might not be considered so sophisticated. I mean, I grew up in a small town in Nebraska and I have a lot of friends who you wouldn't consider glamorous and charming and, and upper class, but they're people I'm really close to. And then you move to the ruggedness and that's your outdoors, tough, masculine kind of, kind of brand. Now, if we look at some of the examples of brands who exhibit these personality traits, Rates. You think about each of the categories and you look at these brands and you go, yeah, yeah actually, I, I do think of a brand like Harley Davidson or Caterpillar as being rugged. And you want that because that's what people want, a personality that they want out of that brand. You look at a brand like um, Intel or Volvo, you want a software system that's very competent. You want a car that's reliable, that you know is dependable. You think about excitement and you know Red Bull that's hard driving and Nike just do it and Tesla with everything that they do with their brand and SpaceX and you know it starts to become clear that each of these brands has a very distinct personality. So this is this is what I would give you as as a homework from our webinar is put your own brand in one of these categories and then see how well you feel that you're living up to what these categories say about a brand. Because if you are, if you're none of them, if you can't, if you can't decide which category you're in, then you clearly haven't defined how you show up in the world. And that will always create clutter because when somebody is looking for something specific, it's, they may find a brand that's specific and they don't like, okay, that's one thing. They'll, they'll actually consider that more and longer than a brand that they can't figure out what category they even go in. So that's your first homework, is to be very clear and specific about what personality you have as a brand. Now, as you move from the personalities, the next thing that you look at is brand voice. You know, how does a company talk about itself in a way that brings this personality out. A brand personality isn't just how you look and, and um, 
what you do. It's also the words and the tones and phrases and topics and everything that you use to express yourself as a brand. And it goes back to, you know, to people. I, I go back to my small town growing up kind of um, background. And I think about, you know, when I think about the brand of, of my friends and the places I went, you know, I, I, I'm always caught when um, people can tell I'm from a small town because I'll say things like, oh, for Pete's sake, and just small town sayings. And that's just part of my brand voice and who I am. Now, when you look at that in the terms of your brand personality and framework, every brand that, that falls into one of these five categories as a framework, they're going to use words that are specific to that personality. They'll use topics that are specific to that personality. They use phrasing. Everything that they do supports the personality, and that's how they show up, and they're very authentic and believable and trusted, and they are able to distinguish themselves from the other brands because they are creating a consistent experience around that personality by the words that they use and, and the things that they talk about. So I, this can be kind of complicated. So let me give you a couple of examples. Here is Red Wing Shoes. And I just took this from their website. But you look at them, they're, they are a rugged brand. They talk about let's go all day, um, premium work boots and shoes, Red Wings for business. Um, their shop Irish Setter, it's um, uh, one of their lines that's for working and hunting. You want a rugged brand if you're this kind, you want a rugged um, uh, voice and topics if you're this kind of brand. And you even look at the imagery. You know, here's a person in a rugged red wing boot who's doing something that you could perceive as, as dangerous. I mean, he could be just 18 inches off the ground, we don't know, or, you know, he could be six stories high. But everything that they do reinforces this. Now, this is one of their other website pages, you know, for workers and hunters. You look, it's um, a cement surface. It's hard, uh, boots and it's, you know, jeans that aren't perfectly tailored and there's the wetness and the ruggedness of the tire. Everything about this creates that reinforcement that this is a rugged brand. Now, compare Red Wing to a brand like Hallmark, and they're, they're a sincerity brand voice, um, brand personality and brand voice. Okay, so celebrate the love that they give, and, you know, it's very emotional driven and very much about the interpersonal relationships and how close you are to people, and they have a lot of different categories to the brand. You know, there's a Hallmark Network. There's lots of um, TV shows that they do. Um, they now have home decor, I discovered when I was digging into them. We've used um, Hallmark stores for cards and for gift wrapping. And then you look at, okay, uh, they also talk about seven out of 10 consumers would spend more at companies with excellent customer service. So they're talking about how can we support you as you emotionally support your employees. Now, it's interesting because you, it, you couldn't flip these brand voices because if you talked about how customers love Red Wing shoes and how it brings people to, you know, workers on site together, people would look at that and go, huh? It's just not how somebody who has a rugged personality shows up in the world. And if you tried to talk about, you know, your love will stand any beating that you put it up to, that's really not the sincerity of a Hallmark brand. And it just feels, it, you know, it feels a little creepy to try and, and switch them around like this. So that's why it's really important. And you start to see the distinction in how these brands show up based on their personality and based on their voice. So when you, what I want you to think about is when people who have long lasting um, impressions on you. You know, it's their personality, it's their voice, it's how they talk about things, what they talk about things. You can do the exact same thing with your brand. So that's, that's your homework for step one, is to identify your brand personality, identify your brand voice. Now go through and see if you're being true to that. Um, you know, is, is this how you talk? to people? Is this how you talk in the stories that you share and things like that? You know, give yourself a grade and then figure out where you are and, and how you can start to do a better job with that because that is a really unique distinction that helps set you apart from other companies. All right. Step number three, communicate internally. Um, this is probably one of the most important things that you can do at any time, but particularly 
right now is don't forget your employees <clears throat> because when when you talk to the outside world you're making a promise and the people who prove to the outside world whether or not you believe it is the employees who are keeping that promise so the biggest representation of a brand next to his logo is its employees but almost i would say pretty much every company spends almost zero time communicating with them or um, i would say communicating them other than a sense of urgency of doing something and there was um, a poll by gallup that showed that 41 percent of employees didn't know what their branding was and if you don't know as an employee if you don't know what your brand is all about then it is really hard for these employees to deliver a distinguishing experience to their customers and so we go back to a brand is a promise that you make to the outside world well who keeps the promises the employees but they don't if they don't even know what that promise is you know, what they deliver and the experience they deliver shows up in whatever kind of mood they're in that day. You know, if they don't have anything bigger to aspire to. And you think about all of the horrible interactions that you've had with a brand because of an employee who just didn't know what was going on and to be honest, probably didn't even care. So when <laughs> I, um, if you asked an employee, what they know about the company generally it's well i got this memo the other day and there was a bunch of numbers in it but you know i don't i don't get it i don't know what was going on and it's because we look at communicating data to um, and information to our employees just like we do for customers but what we have to think about just like for our outside audiences is our inside approach so when we go to reach out to employees what do we do we say okay well we can email and we can do memos you know we could probably put something up on the on the intranet and then how you like what's the best practice for how long an email is or a memo or something on the intranet so we go back to our first point that we default to the format and then we figure out how much we can say in that short amount of time and this is also what kills your brand voice is that in order to be succinct people go back to all of the um the general business lingo things like optimize scrutinize you know i think there's all these list of eyes words you know utilize and it makes people sound ridiculous like we would never talk like that to each other so this is why it's so hurtful is that we don't understand what it is we want to say to employees so we default to what we know now if you take that same approach to storytelling with internal um, with your employees go back to doing the same approach like what's the bigger story that we want to tell how do we create the intrigue and engagement and and make people want to know more about what's going on so they care and they turn around and they deliver that care through the experience they give customers or even each other within an organization because then you have so many opportunities to be creative with the formats that you tell i had one client who we worked on their story internally for customer or um, employees so that they could understand some shifts that were going to happen and and um be able to continually tell this story to the employees so they knew how to change their behavior and better serve customers and they decided the story one of the best ways to get employees to engage with it was to do a weekly comic strip and i i was blown away i thought that was so imaginative but i guarantee you if we had flipped this and started with format then story they never would have started with a comic book strip and it was just wildly successful and i was so proud of them for doing this and, and being able to be creative in that format because that's what people care about now when we go back to this brand personality framework you have to think again what kind of brand am i and you know how do i show up to the inside world internally to my to my employees to my most critical audience with consistency with how i show up to the outside world and then okay there was this there's this company buckingham and i couldn't get examples of these internal um uh communications but they have been known and lauded for the simplicity that they use to talk about what they do so they are a financial services company strategic wealth they call them buckingham strategic wealth um 
So there's this uh, group of advisors and financial specialists, and I know when I interact with financial services companies, sometimes it just, it is so dry, I just can't keep my eyes open. But what they did is that they made it sound like a real person. They brought the um, brand personality, they brought the brand voice, and then they took it internal to employees and made them sound like real people. And this is this is so important because if we look at how how we show up, um, when employees regularly receive interesting, engaging communications from the company that matches the brand's personality and voice about what's going on, they get to know the company. And then the more they get to know it, the more they love it, just like, just like you do a person. Um, it means that um, they're more likely to promote it, they know how to talk about it, um, whether that's a, a marketing person, sales, HR, customer service, they're more proactive in helping customers because they have a better understanding of a company. It's a brand and they know what they stand for, but it also works for people who don't have the traditional face-to-face -face customer roles because they, they still talk with their family and they still talk with their friends and their neighbors. And this over time makes a difference in how a company is perceived. And you know, especially when it comes to hiring, the better reputation a company has as an employer, the higher quality candidates that you have to choose from. And that means if you wanna build a high quality brand, you have to start with high quality employees. Um, it, it builds stronger ties between employees that also builds stronger ties between a brand and their customers, which is always really impactful. So I know, again, I just covered a lot in a short amount of time, Tiffany. Do we, do we have any questions? So we have a lot of people wondering, can my brand have two, like competence and sophisticated, or can there be a primary and a secondary? Um, so there's a lot of people wondering, how do I do that? So maybe if there's two product lines, could each product line be a different one? Um, so I think that's probably a good time to address that. You know, and, and this is, um, uh, and I look at branding in different ways, and it's a little hard to answer the question about, you know, different product lines and personalities, because part of that depends on how the company is set up and how each of the products are set up under a bigger brand umbrella. So I have worked with companies that they look at, um, uh, okay, so I'll start out first. You have a primary personality, and then you may have a secondary one that can that can help it be a little bit more distinct, but you do not have two or three primary personalities, just like a person. You know a person, the people you know you can put into these categories. So you need to be specific about what your brand is and that personality. And, the, and I have people say, it's too hard, I can't pick just one. Here's why you have to, because if you can't be crystal clear yourself with how the brand shows up in the world, it creates confusion in the mind of your audience, in the mind of your customers, your potential customers, your employees. And the more confusion, even if it feels little and they can't, they don't like consciously know it, the less they'll engage with you. It's, it's it, the more clear you can be, the more specific, that's what matters in people's minds. So that's why I'm adamant about one personality, perhaps the second, you know, you could be a, a slightly more, um, sincere rugged brand or you know a slight more um exciting competent kind of company but you have one core personality now when it comes to understanding uh, for product lines the reason i say it depends on how the company set up in the brand architecture is because if you are uh a, a company that has one overarching brand, but you allow each of the product lines essentially to be their own company and brand, which I see a lot of companies do, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, then the, the buyer and the marketplace knows the brand as that product. And that's a strategic decision that the company needs to make, that that's how you're perceived in the market. So if that's the case, yes, you can have a rugged, product brand, you can have a competent one, you can choose, you can pick and choose, but that's because people know the product as its own brand. And it's a company that's not trying to do a solution sale and bundle together groups of products. Now, if you're trying to create a more cohesive brand and you want to be able to um, sell groups of products together in a suite, as it's called, to um, saying that you're selling to solve a problem, 
for somebody to make it a solution sale, then you need to have cohesiveness in how all of those products show up. And um, Emerson in St. Louis, they've done a phenomenal job over the, the last, especially the last, I would say, eight years in doing making that exact switch from a brand that's known for independent brand, um, a company that's known for independent brands into bringing it all under one umbrella and solving people's problems by delivering an entire solution that includes multiple products. But it's it's a strategic choice that you have to make. And again, neither is right or wrong, but you have to be thoughtful and make sure that it's something that you're, you're consciously doing. Uh, uh, you know, I think I still have two more. So if we have more questions, how about if we cover them at the end, would that be good? Yeah, let's, that's perfect. Let's wrap up with the last two steps. Okay. Step number four, let employees create a human voice. So this, this, is really, this is really important, and it's hard for brands to understand how to do it. I love this quote from Simon Sinek, that we don't do business with companies, we do business with people. Um, it's the, you know, on our purchase order or credit card, of course it's the brand that shows up, but we don't, we don't think about this. I mean, you know, consciously I'll say, you know, oh, well, I'm going to call, you know, Fred because he's my contact at, at whatever company. Um, but, but we don't know what to do oftentimes to create that personality for our brand. So some companies have gone beyond just the personality framework and the voice, and they, doc, they have a document that outlines the company's tone, specific ways that product names are laid out and a lot of official ways that the company's supposed to sound and how it talks in official communication. Like I had one company there. Um, brand name was two words, and in this document it said you could never have those two words split between a line. So those are a lot of technical things about how the brand shows up, and it's all important. I'm not saying that it's it, we should ignore it, and it has its place, but here's why we need to remember that at the end of the day, customers are people who talk to our employees who, you guessed it, are, are people too. Because employees who constantly talk in that brand voice, they don't sound human. You can tell when you talk to somebody and they're reading a script or they're using something that is on brand, it's because it's not how we talk to each other. And, and the people who constantly talk in brand voice, um, it just, it sounds robotic. And that's the last thing, especially right now, that's the last thing that you want is to sound robotic. Now, here's an example. This is a company called Indium, and they sell um, soldering equipment and supplies for B2B markets. They have this blog <clears throat> that they call from one engine, <clears throat> excuse me, from one engineer to another. And in it, it is a blog that is literally written by engineers in the company. And they answer the questions that other engineers, whether it's their customers or other engineers in the company or uh, industry have. Now you look at this, it's, it's more formal, it's more specific, it's more technical, but that's actually how Kim would talk. So it sounds different than if you go to the branded page, you know, about us and products and things like that. It sounds different, but she's not speaking necessarily on behalf of Indium. I mean, she's an employee, of course, but she's talking like Kim would. So it's an opportunity for her to, to sound like a real human being, and that makes the other engineers connect with her. Now, this is a, a blog post that was written by someone who works at Marketo, a, um, a CRM platform, and she also sounds like herself, Rena, you know, it's, it's different in how the company pages sound. Um, but this is what builds that emotional connection one trust point at a time is that you let the employees sound like themselves. Now, one of the examples I have loved to see over the past month is um, the National Cowboy Museum in Oklahoma City. So they closed the museum and they turned over the social media accounts to Tim, who's the head of security. And this is his announcement that he says, hello friends, my name is Tim and I'm the head of security for the Cowboy Museum. I've been asked to take on this extra um, duty, you know, so he's gonna, he's, he's honest and he's, you know, very funny and innocent about um, what this all is. He doesn't really know, you know, what's content, what's platforms and, and uh, you know, I'm going to be on the Twitter and the Facebook and the Instagram. He's just, He's who he is, and this is very different from how the Cowboy Museum talks about itself. But you go through the different social media channels. I mean, I picked a couple here from Instagram, and he talks about here's something that John Wayne wore in his movie, and he ends it with, um, 
I'm learning that I need to put hashtags and this is what it is. So he uses the sign and then he puts the word hashtag John Wayne. And it's really funny and it's interesting. And he brings out that personality and that all bubbles up to reflect the true personality and the brand voice of the museum. Now, this has been so successful that the museum now has launched um, T-shirts and hats and coffee mugs that celebrate Tim because he's become so popular. He has made up just them allowing this employee to bring his true voice to his work has brought them to the attention of, of national media um, because people love that the brand is bringing the humanness into it. So it's been a really fun experiment to watch. Now, uh, the last one that I'll talk about is how we, how we become more strategic about creating content. And to be truthful, this really brings everything that we've talked about in the previous four steps into one step. So as we look at as we look at the content that we create, okay, before you create any piece of content, ask yourself, what question does this answer for our customer, for our potential customer, for our employees? Because I absolutely guarantee you this, all of those questions have changed significantly in the last 60 days, 45 days, and they're going to do the same in the next 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. This is so important. So as you're looking at how, how do I make my brand stand out? How do I show up um, in a way that brings my personality and my voice? How do I make sure that employees are on board, that we give them their voice? You have to look at um, becoming more strategic and you have to fight that urge that a lot of brands have to just keep creating content that tells people that, um, that you, content that you want them to know. And you have to replace it with what it is that they want to know now. So especially now, the content isn't about you. It's about your customer. It's about your potential customer. It's about your employee. And look at how you structure your content in a way that answers these questions. And as we look at budgets getting cut, people having to do more with what they have, this is so important because, um, there's research that says at least 70% of the content that a company produces is never ever used. So take advantage of these budget cuts and say, okay, well, let's be more strategic about our time, our money and our resources. And let's make sure that what we do create has a specific story. And then we'll talk about format and not waste time on a format when people don't care about the story. Let's make sure it brings out our personality. Let's make sure it sounds like us with a voice. Let's make sure our employees know what's going on and let's empower them to have their own voice and create those human connections right now. So this, this, is, um, this is that summary and it, it helps take the stress off the work that you do because asking yourself this question helps you be that much more strategic. So I'll just run through these five steps just to summarize them really quickly is, Ask yourself, what's the story we want to tell first? And then we can look at the format because it, it gives you a lot of opportunities to be creative and show up differently that other brands aren't thinking about. I guarantee you that. Define your brand personality and voice and make that come out through everything you present. Communicate internally. Your employees matter now more than they ever have before to represent your brand. And give the employees, you know, a chance to bring out that human voice. Take away that, that robotism when they have to talk in the official approved brand voice. And fifth, be strategic about how much content you create. So there, I know I covered a ton in, in the time that we have, um, Tiffany, but I'll hand this back to you. Yeah, well, you did, but thank you, Carla. I think that those were the steps that I think a lot of people are really craving right now because they're actionable and they're things we can start doing today, really. Um, so that was great. So if you're ready to get started on one or more of these simple steps, just know that Allegra is ready to help. So these steps really align with what we do at our core, um, which is strategic marketing and print communications. So whether it's connecting with customers and prospects through different communication materials, suiting your team up with branded apparel, or implementing customer surveys to keep a close watch on your brand perception. That's really what Allegra has experience with, with businesses and organizations of all sizes. And while we can be that strategic partner that helps put all of these branding pieces together for you, we also recognize that you may have more immediate print and marketing needs right now. And since safety and security are on top of mind for everyone, really no matter what business you're in, 
Allegra can help you prepare to reopen your doors with confidence, and you'll see here just a few of the ways that we can help. And one of the most important pieces is making sure that your audience knows you're ready to assist them. And just a few of the ways that we can help share that message include direct mail and flyers, email marketing, social media marketing, and much more. And something else you might want to consider right now is there really hasn't been a better time for an online ordering system that allows you to streamline the ordering and management of your marketing materials and business forms. But if you really don't know where to start or you just need some guidance on all of the changes that you might need to consider either reopening or rebounding, you can rely on our reopening checklist. This checklist was designed to help you prepare your physical space and employees, get you ready for customers and visitors, and then reach your key audiences. So our goal with this checklist is to help guide you through all of the ways you can meet required guidelines and provide peace of mind as you resume business operations. So if this is something that would be helpful for you, you can either reach out to your local Allegra for a copy, or you can simply let us know in the chat box. And for those of you that have worked with us, you know that we are your local strategic partner and that we bring you these types of thought leadership ideas like you saw in today's webinar often. But remember that if you have a more immediate or maybe even unique need and you need help of any sort, don't be afraid to ask because that's really what the community is for here. So we did get a couple more questions that came in, Carla, so I'll take these last couple minutes just to go through these. And one that we got a couple of times was that, it's a little bit more of a comment, I guess, is that our company has to focus on getting more sales in the door right now. That we don't have the time or money to put towards those employee communications you were speaking of because priority is, our, our number one priority is our revenue. Oh, that, it makes me a little sad to hear that. Um, but I know there's a lot of companies that think that, that it's just like, uh, and, I, and I understand, I'm not saying that bringing money in the door right now isn't a huge priority for people. But when you focus only on the outside and let's bring money in the door and ignore your internal audience, you are essentially cutting off a huge uh, support group that can help you bring money in the door. Because if, back to the 41% of your employees who don't know what your brand stands for to start with, and then you add on top of that, they have no idea what's going on right now in a time of chaos. It just, um, it, it can cut those efforts off at the knees that you're really working so hard on externally to bring in revenue because they don't know what's going on. Um, you know, there's confusion, there's indecision, there's fear that they're gonna do something wrong and, and they'll lose their job. So the best thing that you can do to support all of those outside efforts is to make sure that your employees are informed. And believe it or not, they, they're a great source of ideas for how you can tweak what you're doing, doing it differently, because they've all seen something that affects a customer just from a different lens. And it's a way to get in ideas that can be very helpful, that can make a huge difference in your outside sales, just by making sure that you bring your employees along for the ride and make them a part of all that's going on and, and really empower them. All right, and we have one more actually about employees and giving them a human voice. Um, and this person says they agree that to give your employees a human voice, but how are you going to ensure that the voice still fits with your overall brand voice? I think part of that comes from when you are clear about your um, brand personality, that, and, and um, when you are clear about your brand personality, it has helped filter the type of people that you hire. So you have people coming in who support that personality because if you are a rugged brand and you have somebody who is such a soft hearted person and so sincere about anything, they probably won't make it through the recruiting process because they'll see it's just a, such a conflict for what matters most to them. The same with a rugged person going to a sincere brand. So I'm gonna start with the fact that when you've been clear with your personality, it shows up in the filter of hiring. So you already know you have somebody who believes in that um, and supports that personality. And if you've been consistent with your own voice, they start to observe that. Now, the, the part about letting employees speak for themselves is that they're going to use words and phrases and how they talk about things that might not follow a specific brand guideline and, and all of this stuff, but they're showing up as a, an employee who represents your brand. Now, it doesn't mean they still don't have to follow basic business etiquette with you know language and and um, uh, things they're not allowed to talk about because it's you know proprietary or things like that. 
But if you just put together some simple training and teach people, you know, here's your parameters, here's what you can talk about, you know, here's what you can't talk about, um, and, you know, give them a little training on what is your brand personality, what is your brand voice, so you don't just send them off into the wild without any equipment, you know, that makes a lot of people nervous. Um, you can have great examples of employees who are showing up that way, whether it's in, you know, a blog or a video, um, social media, however it shows up but you, you do have that opportunity and you can begin to trust them, but you do have to spend time, you know, at least a little bit of time explaining that voice and um, how they how they use it and, and letting them speak for themselves because they're, they're doing it anyway. When they're, you know, networking on social media or they're with somebody in real life, they're already talking about your brand. So if you're not comfortable with that situation, you have to think about that first, but that's an, an opportunity for you to give people training and, and let them represent your brand in a way that really makes them proud. And there was a webinar we did, I think it was last year, Tiffany, that talks about, um, it was uh, Molson Coors, how they trained their employees on it and then sent them off to represent the brand in a couple of different opportunities. And it was just, it was crazy successful in a way they never imagined. Right, yes, we did do that one last year. Uh -huh. So we've gotten a couple questions just asking about if they can get a copy of these slides. So just a reminder, we will be sending a link with the recording and the slides. Um, but we are to uh, our hour mark. So I just want to wrap up by thanking you all again for joining us today. And I really do hope that you've been able to take down some action items that are going to make a difference. But if you do need additional support, you can always contact your local expert at Allegra. But if you're not already working with us, you can find your nearest partner by visiting www.allegramarketingprint.com. So thank you again, Carla, and we hope everybody has a wonderful day.